together for the reading and hearing of God's Word from the New Testament this morning, the resurrection chapter of the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 50 and reading through verse 58. The Apostle Paul says, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. In other words, never be lacking in zeal. But keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. And it's a joy to have all of you here this beautiful Lord's Day. I'm privileged to have some family here today or some of Rhonda's family. Her first cousin is here today. It's good to see Shannon and her family. Part of them are here with her today. And it's good to have some friends here, Jesse and Mary Lee. And they have a young man with them. I believe this is Rose's Nate. That's right. All right. Rose's son. Glad to have you today. And this is a special day for me. This actually marks one year that we gathered, many of you did, with me on a Saturday last year, April the 30th, to celebrate my beloved wife's life. Her one-year anniversary of passing to be with our Lord was this past Wednesday, April the 26th. And I happened to be in revival, and that was scheduled in March of 2016 before Rhonda passed. I took solace in knowing that God had given me a divine appointment. He knew that that's where I needed to be one year before I actually got there, knowing that it would be the one-year anniversary of her passing. But the Lord gave me an opportunity to minister to that congregation and a number of teenagers in that community because one of their friends, a teenage boy, dropped dead suddenly without any explanation. And that they were in grieving and mourning. And I was able, on the one-year anniversary of Rhonda's passing, to minister life to those hurting teenagers. And so to God be the glory. Well, this morning what I want to do is preach a message of tribute uh, to Rhonda, but not just to Rhonda, but to all of our loved ones who have died in Christ. Do any of you have some loved ones who have died in faith in Christ? They've, they've passed on. Can I see your hand? Anybody out there? Wow, that's practically everybody here. And so today I want to preach a message entitled, When Dust Shall Sing. When Dust Shall Sing. But as I said, it's, it's not a, just about Rhonda. It's about everyone who has died in Christ since Adam. It really is. And let me go ahead and give you a disclaimer, lest you think, oh boy, this is going to be a sad, melancholy message. No, it's not. I promise you. And if you don't get blessed, then your blesser's broken. That This is not a, a eulogy, and it's not a requiem and a dirge. We're not here at a funeral. We're here to celebrate life in Christ and the resurrection of the body. All right, so let's talk about the resurrection of the body. And the reason we can even talk about it is because Christ is risen from the dead. Amen. If he were not risen, then, well, I would just send you home. There's no need to be here. But because Christ is risen and He lives forevermore, I can talk to you about this subject today. 1 Corinthians 15 and 20, Paul says, The truth is that Christ has been raised from death. We often quote that, but we don't finish the verse. We just 
quote the first part of it. But now is Christ risen indeed. But there's more to that verse. There's a comma, not a period, a comma. As the guarantee, everybody say guarantee. As the guarantee that those who sleep in death. Now he's not teaching soul sleep there. Some believe that. We don't believe the scripture teaches that. The soul, the spirit is very present with God and very much alive and alert. But the body is sleeping. And so those who sleep, that is their bodies the bodies who sleep in death will also be raised. So let's talk about it today. Some have said this is the hardest doctrine to believe, the resurrection of the body. Why is it so hard for many to wrap their arms around? Because the harsh reality of death can erode your faith. If you've ever laid anybody in the ground, a loved one, then you know how devastating that can be. You know how depressing, how discouraging, disheartening. You know the grief that attends the death of someone that you love dearly, a spouse, a child, a parent, a brother, a sister, a close friend. And, and you know that it, it can take you a long time to process your grief and, and to get beyond that. And so that's why I believe it is imperative for me as a follower of Jesus to on a regular basis, daily even, to make a good confession of faith. The word is nigh you, it's near you, even in your mouth, that if you will confess the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. And I believe we ought to confess our faith as it relates to all the promises of God and as it relates to life after death. And so I believe that is, is imperative that, that we confess our faith, and we're going to do that this morning. This phrase that you see in smaller print in red is taken right out of the Apostles' Creed. You say, well, what is the Apostles' Creed? Well, you may not realize it, but you sang it this morning. <laughs> and we're going to sing it again at the end. But you sang uh, the Apostles' Creed. Maybe not word for word verbatim, but you sang the Apostles' Creed. And the next to the last phrase says, I believe in the resurrection of the body. So that's the sermon in one sentence. So let's practice it this side right here to my left on this wing. You ready? Go. I Right here in the middle, your turn, go. I. Right here on this side, I. Everybody, I believe in the resurrection of the body. One more time, I believe in the resurrection of the body. Now that's an absolutely stupendous declaration. And the reason it is so stupendous and enormous is because death is the fundamental human problem. It is our greatest fear. It is the sum of all other fears. We spend annually $20 billion in an industry to help us process our grief and deal with death. And thanks be to God for every funeral home that dots the landscapes of our world, uh, those in our community, Bowling Gross and Lots and Harrisons in Lexington, they do a superb job. They are personable and they are professional and that they will even spend time with a grieving family to help them. I know because they have done it with me and that they do their best to make our loved ones who have expired look their best. We do our best to make them look like they're not dead. We say things like, he looks so natural. She just looks so peaceful. We use euphemisms to soften the shock to our senses. He passed on. She departed. They slipped away. He went to glory. And for a child of God, all of that is true. And yet, I'm being very transparent with you that even though you know those things intellectually and you believe them in your heart, death nonetheless stands as a stark reality. It poses the question that is asked by philosophers, theologians, and grieving families alike, a question that has been around for ages, a question that Job wrangled with. It's taken right out of the book of Job, which was the oldest book in the Bible. Job was written even before Moses wrote the Pentateuch. And so we have this oldest book in the Old Testament scriptures out of which comes this question that Job wrestled with. The question is, if a man dies, will he live again? And Paul, when he was arguing 
for the resurrection of the dead. He said this in 1 Corinthians 15, 32, if. He gives all these presuppositions. They began with if, if, if. If this is not true, then that can't be true. If the dead are not raised, then what is the logical conclusion? If the dead are not raised, let's just eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. If all there is beyond the grave is nothing, if the grave is it, that's our final stopping point and this body returns to dust and ash and the soul and the spirit cease to be then we might as well embrace the philosophy of the Epicureans we might as well have one perpetual happy hour I'll just dismiss you now go on find you a bar somewhere get drunk live it up I mean if if that's all there is but Paul gets us to verse 20 and he says but now is Christ risen indeed from the dead and he has become the guarantee, the earnest, the first fruits of those who have died in Christ. So you've got to mark it down. Put it in big, bold boxcar letters. If we do not have an answer to death, then our religion is useless. And that's where this penultimate phrase, penultimate meaning the next to the last, from the Apostles' Creed is so informative for our faith. I believe in, you want to say it with me again, the resurrection of the body. You say, well, what's the last phrase? Comma, the life everlasting. And what's the final word? Amen. Amen. I believe in the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. Now, why is that important? Because the Greeks and modern Hindus see the body as merely the covering or the container for the soul, something to discard when we die so the soul can be set free. Christians, in contrast, believe that our redemption includes the body. And that's where 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the resurrection chapter of the New Testament, uh, has such weight uh, on this subject. There are three things here for us to see in Paul's writing. One, the bodies we have. Two, the death we'll face. And three, the resurrection we'll enjoy. Let's look at the bodies that we have. There is this love-hate relationship with this body that we have. Because this body that we have is uh, aging as a result of uh, Adam and Eve's fall in the Garden of Eden, original sin that has now resulted in a curse. And that curse shows up in these mortal, perishable bodies that we now have. You may feel like this guy who's wearing this T-shirt. He says, I'm a 20-year-old stuck in a 60-year-old body. And the fact of the matter is, as we progress in age and our bodies grow older, they start to wear out, uh, they start to sag and expand. Uh, we end up with wrinkles in places we'd rather not have them and creaky joints and hardened arteries and what at one time was firm and, and perky is now, well, gravity has pulled it down uh, and the heart slows down and the eyes grow dim and the, teeth, the ears don't hear as well as they did and the teeth fall out and the back is stooped and the arms grow weary and bones are more susceptible to breaking and muscles weaken and we have bulges in places that we try to camouflage. My trainer Eric reminds me that black is complementary to this outward body. So now when Hannah says, Dad, you always wear black. Why can't you wear some colors? I've, I've got an answer because I'm camouflaging the bulges, baby. That's what I'm doing, amen, <laughs> covering them up. And so we have these bodies that are growing older. It's just the way it is. I came across an article a while back entitled 51 Signs You're Getting Older. Don't worry, I'm not going to share all 51. I just pulled a few out of it. I was glad when it said large print version. You know you're getting older when, number one, everything hurts, and what doesn't hurt doesn't work. The gleam in your eyes is from the sun hitting your bifocals. You look forward to a dull evening. At my house, we're in bed by 9 o'clock, lights out. Rachel and David said, Dad, I know we live like two old souls, like an old married couple. Lights out, 9 o'clock. Your favorite part of the newspaper is the section that says, 20 years ago today. <laughs> Here's another one. You sit in a rocking chair and you can't get it going. Your knees buckle and your belt won't. <laughs> your back goes out more than you do. You sink your teeth into a stake and they stay there. 
You're asleep, but others worry that you died. <laughs> you have a dream about prunes. And I love this one. Your ears are hairier than your head. <laughs> you got the fall off disease. It all fell off. Fell on the ears, fell on the back, fell some other places. <laughs> when, when you bend over, you look for something else to do while you're down there. You like, you like that character? There. Anybody recognize that old man, by the way? Anybody know who that is? Tim Conway. When I see that, I always think of Tim Morrison. Not because Tim Morrison looks like Tim Conway. Only when he gets in costume and puts the wig on, he can do a perfect Tim Conway impersonation. Well, Drace did it too. What was that? What was that uh, dinner theater? Something about the great escape, about those residents in the nursing home. Yeah, that, that's what you look like. <laughs> in, in that. Uh, but, you know, as we're getting older, we get more concerned with diet and exercise and fashion. And, and we should because we're stewards of this body. And, and I'm grateful that there's a new profound appreciation in my life for stewardship of this mortal body. Uh, Eric Wheeler has helped me immensely. He holds me accountable. He instructs me. He trains me. We meet once a week. And uh, I've lost 30 pounds so far on this journey. I told you I was going to lose 50. I still got a ways to go. I'm on my way. I'll get there by the grace and help of God and with the help of people like uh, Eric Wheeler. But you know, the fact of the matter is, even though I can be a good steward of this body, and thanks be to God for divine healing, those are foretaste and foretokens of that which is yet to come when we'll, this perishable will put on an imperishable body. But the fact is, I, I can't stop this body from aging. I may can slow it down, but I can't stop it. When you find the cure for that, you let me in on it and we'll market it together and we'll retire early. How about that? The, the fact is, this body continues to age. Your body is a gift from God that won't last forever. And so the bodies that we have will lead, unless we go in the rapture, it will lead to the death that we'll face. And that's a fact for everybody. Read the book of Genesis, read all the genealogies, and you'll read a refrain, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. And, he died. and if you live long enough, your name will show up in an obit somewhere, and he died, she died. It's just a fact. Now, I could announce today that we're going to have a pizza party this Friday night. We're going to have all the pizza you can eat. JJ's is going to cook it up for us. Uh, it's going to be hot and fresh. They're going to give us every pizza they have on their menu. We're going to have all the soda pop you can drink. Come on out and join us. Oh, by the way, I'm going to be talking about death and dying. And I have a feeling that I'd probably be the only person there. Because we really don't enjoy a conversation about death and dying. But it's necessary from time to time that we talk about it. And the preacher who never brings it up is not a very good preacher. So what does the Bible say about death? It tells us a number of things. Number one, death is certain. It is appointed unto man once to die. Death is not the end. After that, the judgment, Hebrews 9, 27. The Bible also tells us that Christ defeated death. He abolished death, 2 Timothy 1 and 10. The Bible also tells us that death yet remains the last enemy, according to 1 Corinthians 15 and 26. And therein is the rub. It creates quite the puzzle, a conundrum for us as believers, as followers of Christ. I mean, if Christ has abolished death, why do we still die? And how can death be both abolished and yet the last enemy of the people of God? What's the answer to this conundrum? Is there even an answer to that question? And yes, there is an answer to that question. And right out of the Holy Scripture, we discover that the answer lies in understanding the basic nature of death. Dr. Charles C. Rice said the essence of death is separation. And that's a biblical explanation about death. The essence of death is separation. Death is the, everybody say it with me, unnatural. Say it again. Unnatural. One more time. Unnatural separation of the body and the spirit. And so that runs counter to the popular notion that death is a natural part of life. You say, wait a minute, time out, W.A. You just told us that the aging process is natural. It's natural in that it is the result of sin in the Garden of Eden. And so is death. 
But the point that I want you to understand from the Scripture is that aging and disease and death and dying was not God's original plan. That's not what He intended for us. You see, we need to understand that death came into the world because of sin, Romans 5 and 12. Therefore, death exists because sin exists. And when sin has been removed once and for all, guess what? Death will no longer exist. That's why there will be no death in heaven. Revelation 22, 3, 4. There will be no more death, no more dying in heaven. So death is really unnatural because sin is unnatural. But if that's all we had, that would be depressing. But we have a whole lot more than that. There's more to the story. And here's the rest of the story. There is a world where death no longer exists. This present, transient, temporary world feels so real to us, but really it's passing away. It's transient. It's temporary. It's, it's not here for eternity. Christ truly destroyed death. He abolished death when He died and rose again. Death itself will one day die and the true state God intended will be restored. And what a day that's going to be. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, but it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when we see Him, when we see Christ, we shall be like Him, for we will see Him as he is. Oh, that glorious day, that glad reunion day. It is coming, beloved. It is coming. Amen. Yes, indeed. But until that day comes, we live in an odd situation best described by Ecclesiastes 12 and 7. The dust returns to the ground it came from, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. And that's why when you go to the grave, you will often hear the pastor after he's read Scripture, depending on how liturgical he may be, he will then do what is called a committal. And in that committal, he will say something like this, ashes to ashes and dust to dust. And friend, if that's all there was, we would have no hope. If that's all there was, I would have had to resign as your pastor. Because I would have fallen into a clinical state of depression. I would have fallen into a black hole. I probably would have ended up in a padded room somewhere. If all there was, if all there is, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. But Paul tells us here in this resurrection chapter that that's not a period if you know your grammar, that's just a comma <laughs> because there's more to the story. You see, there's not only the bodies that we have and the death that we'll experience, but there is the resurrection that we'll enjoy. And that's why Paul says, let me tell you a wonderful secret that God has revealed to us. Not all of us will die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blinking of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. But when the trumpet sounds, the Christians who have died and will be raised with transformed bodies. And then we who are living will be transformed so that we will say it with me, never die, so that we will never die, so that we will never die. For our perishable earthly bodies must be transformed into heavenly bodies that will never die. When this happens, when our perishable earthly bodies have been transformed into heavenly bodies that will never die, then at last the Old Testament Scriptures will come true. Death is swallowed up in victory. Old death, where is your victory? Old death, where is your sting? Three things at least that happen in this passage. Number one, the resurrection of the body will happen instantly. In a moment, in the blinking, the twinkling of an eye, faster than you can bat your eyelid. There's nothing gradual or progressive about this. It's in a moment. In the one moment, 
the dead in Christ are planted in the ground. And the next moment, their bodies have risen out of that grave. Amen. Secondly, it will happen when Jesus returns. When Gabriel blows that trumpet and the trumpet call of God is heard, that clarion call that goes out all across this world, all over this earth, then the dead in Christ are going to give up their bodies. And it will result in our total, complete, wholesale transformation. This mortal will put on him mortality this corruptible will put on incorruption all for the glory of God thanks be to his holy name amen but Paul knew that you would have some more questions <laughs> you know you answer one question that precipitates another question and so someone may ask how will the dead be raised? What kind of bodies will they have? What a foolish question. When you put a seed into the ground. Well, Paul's right there. Anybody got a, a garden this season? Anybody planted one yet? Anybody? Nobody? Adam, I know you have. I know you have. Yeah. David, my son-in-law, he, they're traveling today, but he, he's got, I've had to water them this weekend. He's got some raised gardens out of the ground. Adam, when you planted your garden, did you put full, did you just go to the grocery store food line and get some squash and bury the squash in the ground? No. What else you got? Tomatoes? You just took a, a vine ripened tomato and buried it? No. What else you got? You just, you just went to Walmart and, and got some zucchini and buried the zucchini? No. Now what did you bury? Everybody got that? This is, this is gardening 101. Everybody got it? He planted a seed. So when you put a seed into the ground, it doesn't grow into a plant unless it dies first. And what you put in the ground is not the plant that will grow, but only a dry little seed of wheat or whatever it is that you are planting. Let me explain it like this. How many of you have seen a big, mighty, massive oak tree with its green leaves giving that canopy of shade? You say, I want one of those. And so you tell the husband, I want you to go dig that one up by its roots, that big one right there, and I want you to plant it in my yard. Well, that's not how you get it, right? No, that big, mighty, massive oak came from a little acorn. So you, you, you cut the acorn open and you look and you say, I know there's got to be a little, tiny, minuscule, miniature oak tree already in that little acorn. No, the potential is there, but it's a seed. You've got to plant that seed and that seed has to die first. Hey, Adam, have your seeds died? The seeds you planted, did they die? How do you know they died? Because, didn't you tell me early service, there's some green foliage that is pushing up out of the earth and sod? There's some new life? The only way that could happen is if the seed had been planted and it died. Hang on, buddy. I'm going somewhere. Are you ready for this? What does that mean? Well, it means, here we, are, here we go. The resurrection of the body is necessary to reverse the effects of sin, to reverse old age, to reverse cancer and disease, leukemia, lupus, even... The organs that you don't have anymore. You're going to see a reversal of that with the resurrection. Because redemption touches the body, not just the soul. On that resurrection morning, when the redeemed are gathering in, I'll have a new body, I'll have a new life. Oh, praise the Lord, I'm going to have a new body. Amen. 
and your salvation will not be complete until your body becomes immortal and imperishable. So this clarifies a crucial misunderstanding about the saints who are already in heaven. The body that will be raised will be a new body, not just the old one patched up. Now, if you want him just to patch up your body, you can put your request in. As for me, I want a new one. Amen. Just give me a new body. I, I want a new body fashioned like unto the Lord's. Amen. Immortal. Imperishable. Amen. And so he's not just going to patch up this old body. He's going to give us a new body. Guess what? Your individual personality continues in the resurrection. You will still know me as W.A. Mills. I'll still know you by your name and your personality and who you are. We're all going to be like Jesus, though. Isn't that the wonderful thing? And that means we'll be totally glorified and fully sanctified. And, and that means that the effects of sin and the scars of a sinful past, they, they will all be gone. Amen. And so let me just break it down for you. That means that whatever you don't like about this old guy, guess what? Jesus is going to take care of that in the resurrection. And I promise you'll like me in the resurrection. Amen. Hallelujah. That's good news. Amen. And everybody's going to like you in the resurrection because we're going to be like the Lord Jesus. Amen. So right here in the present, our bodies are kind of like an old jalopy. (laughs) You can only get so many miles out of that car. (laughs) Even though you do all the PMs, the preventive maintenance, and you change the oil every 3,000 miles. Isn't that right, Robbie? You want a good old change of Lexington Express lube. I did, that wasn't in my notes, by the way, but it fit real good. Amen. See my friends, Robbie and Dawn, they'll hook you up. Take care of that car, best of all synthetic products. But even then, guess what? That car is still eventually, it's get up and go, it's going to get up and go. <laughs> it's going to be gone. And you might have to replace the engine, and you might have to replace the transmission You get the analogy? But in the resurrection, guess what? You're going to get a new car. (laughs) It's going to be like a a brand new Rolls Royce, Robbie. And and I won't ever have to bring it to the express loop. Amen. I won't ever have to overhaul the engine. The transmission will never need to be replaced. I I won't ever have to paint it again. Amen. It will be perfect. Because what the Bible teaches and what I preach and what I believe is whole. W-H-O-L-E. Whole salvation. Not just soul salvation. Amen. The resurrection of the body is the final step in our salvation. Listen, we are saved from the penalty of sin. That happened the moment you trusted Christ as your Savior and Lord. At that moment, you were saved, delivered, rescued, set free, emancipated from the penalty of sin. Jesus, your sins on the cross, He paid for them in full. We are saved presently from the power of sin. And that happens every day as we walk in submission and surrender to the Lordship of Christ. As we are trusting Him, our sanctifier, Jehovah M. Kadesh, to make us holy even as He is holy. But guess what? There is coming a day, hallelujah, in the resurrection when we will be saved from the very presence of sin. Can't wait to get there where there is no sin, no heartache, no brokenness, no addictions, no enslavements, no bondages. Amen. Can't wait to get there when I see Him, the one who died for me, the one who rescued me, the one who liberated me, the one who redeems me from the curse of the law. Amen. Thanks be to Almighty God. And so Paul said, our bodies now disappoint us. (laughs) Hello, can anybody identify? Look in the mirror. Just look in the mirror. You can look in the mirror tomorrow and say, oh, we can go home and look today if you want. Boy, this body sure is disappointing. (laughs) But when they are raised, they will be full of glory. They are weak now. But when they are raised, they will be full of power. That's why Job said, Job 19, 25 through 27, I know, I know, I know, I know. (laughs) I'm convinced, I'm persuaded, I believe, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end He will stand on the earth. Now we hear that quoted a lot, especially on Easter. But we don't often hear the rest of it. The rest of it is an after my skin, my 
flesh. My body has been destroyed when it has been eaten by the worms and the maggots and all that is left is a trace of what was uh, when all that remains uh, is a skeleton and then eventually the earthworms uh, and the maggots devour that skeleton and all that's left is dust in the earth. Still I myself will see him with my own eyes. I and not another. How my heart yearns within me. Amen. And so the prophet Isaiah said, and now I'm going I'm to land the plane and I'm going to give you the reason for the title of this message. By the way, do you remember the title? When dust shall sink. The prophet says, but your dead will live, Lord. Their bodies will rise. Let those who dwell in the dust wake up. That is their bodies and shout for joy. For your dew is like the dew of the morning. The earth will give birth to her dead. You know why you don't need to feel sorry for me? You know why you don't need to be sad for your pastor? You don't say, oh, bless his little heart. I know he misses Rhonda. You got that right, baby. I miss her more and more all the time. But you don't have to feel sorry for me. You don't have to be sad. Now, if all there was was ashes to ashes and dust to dust, then I'd be right there with you. I'd be sad and mopey and, and dopey and probably hateful and mean and angry. I'm just being real. But you don't need to feel sad for me because my beloved who used to stand on this stage at Christmas and sing, Oh, Holy Night. My beloved who used to sing in a trio with Rachel, our daughter, and me, and we'd harmonize and sing parts, and, 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 and we'd sing about the grace of God and the mercy of God, and I know my Redeemer lives, and, and uh, when I think about what the Lord has done for me and, and how He saved me and how He healed me and how He lifted me, you know what? One day her dust is going to sing again. Amen. That's where I got the title, When Dust Shall Sing, When Dust Shall Sing. And so now when I go to the grave, and I went early this morning out of respect but I go there and I stand at her grave and I say I believe in the resurrection of the body I believe one day dust is going to sing amen we're going to sing the hallelujah chorus together we're going to sing praises to the most high God we're going to glorify the king of kings and the lord of lords I'm going to say baby did you save me a place in the choir let me sing in that choir I'm going to sing with you when dust shall sing. Oh, thanks be to God. So in that resurrection morning, when the trumpet of God shall sound, you're going to help me preach. You ready? When you see it in red, that's your cue. In that resurrection morning, when the trumpet of God shall sound, we shall rise. We shall rise. Uh, then the saints will come rejoicing and no tears will e'er be found. Uh, we shall rise. Uh, we shall rise. Uh, we shall rise. Uh, we shall rise. Uh, we shall rise in that resurrection morning when these prison bars are broken. Uh, we shall rise. Uh, we shall rise. One more time. We shall rise. Uh, we shall rise. We shall rise in that resurrection morning when these prison bars are broken. We shall rise. We shall, uh, one more time, I, I'm going to do it until you rise. We shall rise. We shall rise. We shall rise in that resurrection morning when these prison bars are broken. We shall rise. We shall rise. Oh, hallelujah. Thanks be to God. We shall rise. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Amen. He's talking about the rapture. The rapture of the church. The dead in Christ will rise first. And 
Then we who are alive will be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. I say we shall rise. We shall rise. We shall rise. Hallelujah. All thanks be to God. Daniel the prophet, he saw it coming. This is what he said, Daniel 12 and 2. He said, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Now watch this. Some to everlasting life, comma, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Jesus said in John 5, 28 and 29, a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice. Whose voice? The Lord's voice. And come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live. And those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. It may seem on the surface that Jesus is encouraging a works righteousness here, but he is not. Read John chapter 5 in its entirety, and you'll see how he identifies himself as the life giver. Amen. So I may be talking to somebody this morning and you want to believe that Jesus will forgive you of your sins. But you've done some terrible things, some evil things, some shameful things. Somehow you've allowed the enemy of your soul, the devil, to deceive you into thinking that he may could forgive others, but he could never forgive me. And I just came to remind you that Jesus is more than ready to forgive you sins right here today. Amen. You might recognize your problem is sin. You, you may understand that the penalty of sin is death. You might even recognize that if, if you don't trust Christ you'll end up in eternal death what the Bible calls the second death. But I want to challenge you. You see that little fellow there? I want to challenge you today to step out on the bridge of life. I want to challenge you to cross that bridge. How do I get there? By trusting in Christ alone for your salvation and for the forgiveness of all your sins. And you cross that bridge, the bridge of life, through your faith in Jesus. You get to the other side. And now you have God's promise of eternal life. Now you have Romans 8 and 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You have passed from death 